disrupt that familiar image of the wild-haired flute player leading Jethro Tull through a quarter century of rock and roll. But Ian has another quieter side, which gets an airing on his new album, Divinities, music written for flute and orchestra. Ian joins me now, and it is great to have you on the bridge. Thank you. Pervish Thank you. I, I left my wild hair at home, <laughs> but, but I brought my quarter century with me. There's a wee bit just <laughs> down the back that they can't see, but I can. Yes, it's a sub subject of a later transplant. I'm trying to move to the front. <laughs> um, now, this acoustic album that you've made, which, which it is, um, divinities. It, it is indeed. It, first and foremost, you've got it absolutely right, it is an acoustic album because having been an acoustic musician in a rock band for all of my 27 years of, of doing it for a living, it, that, that was really the point of this, was not to make a classical album for EMI's classical music division, but was to yeah. make a, an acoustic album with other traditional acoustic instruments. Although, of course, to some extent, modern technology allowed us to to, to cheat by using some samples mm -hmm. rather than the expensive uh, human um, versions. But everything was played in real time and, and, and did involve a number of other musicians. Mm, well. did, did they approach you? So this is going to be marketed through the classical classical side of things, this they, album? They started badgering me about a year and a half ago with a request for a meeting. You know, mm -hmm. I was summoned to EMI's classical music division headquarters and managed to keep washing what was remaining of my hair and finding other excuses not to show up. And eventually decided it would only be polite to turn up to explain to them politely why I didn't want to do an album for EMI's Classical Music Division, but a very, very nice and very persuasive man. Um, caused me really to rise to the challenge in the sense that it was clearly they wanted me to write music rather than play somebody else's stuff, which I couldn't do very well because I don't really read mm -hmm. you know, music as it's written. I just memorize it and, and bluff. <laughs> so. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> Uh, with relief, I found they actually wanted me to write something and, um, and uh, that it would be a flute-based thing. Because yeah. I'd never, although I'd been a flute player for a long time, I've never really played it properly and, and, and not really had the opportunity to play it because I'm usually mm. fighting against all these other guys. So it was, it, was, it was good fun to do something that from the word go was written on for uh, and with the flute as the, as the, as the prime instrument. Flute up front, mm. basically. Well. <laughs> <laughs> as they yes. say. Um, well, I mean, with the music that you wrote then, is this kind of s stuff perhaps that you've had in you for a long time that was unable to get an outing perhaps in any other well, incarnation <laughs> that you, or any other work that if, you've been doing? If, if, it, if it was in me, it was, uh, it, it was coaxed out and dragged out in some cases in dressing rooms and hotel rooms yeah. in Jethro Tull's tours of, of the early part of last year, because that's really what I... When I said I would do it, I agreed first of all. I said, look, I'll make you a couple of demos. You probably won't like it, and we can all go home and forget about it. Um, so I did them a couple of demos, and then they said, oh, yeah, we really want to do this. So mm. I had to then go away and write another hour's worth of music, basically, yeah. which, which was kind of tricky because, you know, if you're, if you're not in a position to really concentrate on it, you are snatching at moments here and there in, you know, literally mm. in hotel rooms and dressing rooms when you try to get a little idea and uh, put it onto a little tape machine or something. So the title, Divinities, Twelve Dances with God, where are we heading into, moving into spiritual territory here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. but I mean, you know, we, we, um, we don't, most of us don't need coaxing too much to sort of mm -hmm. be aware of uh, some you know, leanings or yearnings in that direction. It's just that we sort of have been embarrassed to talk about it. But I mean, it is, it, I mean, I, again, it was EMI's idea. They said, why don't you make this a, a conceptual thing and why don't you make it something that has a spiritual or a religious uh, thing behind it? And, then, and I quite, originally I was horrified by that thought, but then I thought, well, maybe there is something here that I can draw on because I travel around an awful lot of places and meet an awful lot of people and the, the cultures and, and societies and the way religion actually affects people's day-to-day -day lives, the way they are the people that they don't like, the, the divisions, the, the jealousies, the, the fear that's within people of different mm -hmm. nations is very often very closely related to an identity, something that comes out of their religion. And so I hope in a respectful and sometimes upbeat and fairly humorous way I try to just acknowledge what I think those religions mean to me most succinctly. Mm -hmm. So have you enjoyed doing this? It sounds from the way you're talking about it that it has been quite challenging but but enjoy it at the same time. Yeah, it was it was in danger of becoming sort of a, a bit of a, you know, a, an intellectual problem to have to solve. How mm. to put something together that would, if backed into a corner, I could argue or talk about, defend as a as a principle as, as a con, as a as a conceptual piece of music. But at the end of it, it's just 
it, it's 12 songs, 12 bits of music that are quite fun mm. to play. And, and I really enjoyed doing it because it was, uh, musically speaking, was good fun to play. And I, I found myself for the first time in a long time really enjoying the sound of the flute. Uh, not to say that I don't enjoy playing it with Jethro Tull, but it was just that you could concentrate on the nuances and uh, made me rethink and relearn to, to quite an extent playing the flute as well. So do you think that will affect perhaps the work that you do with perhaps future albums of Jethro Tull in terms of using the flute? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it, it certainly affected the, the current album that I've just finished doing with Jethro Tull that of course won't be released <laughs> for some months to come. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Um, but yes, indeed, that, that sounds, from a flute-playing point of view, a, a little different, because it, it, there is a, a greater range of uh, yeah. available to me through having spent some serious time brushing up on my playing. So, yeah, I, I noticed the difference. I expect other people will as well. Not, 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 not the only reason, not just better quality of playing, but also a different type of playing, because I started playing an open-hold flute. Uh, Mm. In fact, I re-recorded most of the Divinity's album because I switched to playing an open hole flute and thought, wow, I can really do things with this I can't do with a closed hole flute. It mm. just allows you to bend notes, like a guitarist bending and, and using wide vibratos. It, mm. it gives you a lot more options and, and expression, but it is harder to play. So, are we going to see this album taken, played live? Are you, are you touring with us? Yes, uh, and again, that was always part of the original proviso. I really didn't want to make an album that was just going to be something that a record company would go out and try and sell to who, we're not quite sure, yes. but the, the bottom line for me had to be that it would be at least the subject of a few concerts. So yeah. we're, we're doing um, just basically sort of capital cities, except for the USA where we're playing, being a much bigger country, right. a, a few more cities. And uh, so there's about 20 shows in all during the oh. uh, latter part of May, first half of June. And how many in the band, is, is, if it is a band? I guess it's, it's or an it ensemble. It is sort of a band, yes. Yeah. It's an ensemble, but, um, you know, with sort of violin and upright bass as well as modern instrument you know high tech stuff and uh, but you know real percussion and it's a sort of it's everybody's doing the job of two or three people really in order to uh, to make it sound right but it should be it should be a reasonable um, recreation i think of what's on the record and just mentioning very briefly before before you go here jethro tell when do we see new material from from you and jethro tell or jethro tell on the road Sh yes. Scheduled for, uh, I believe it's the 28th of August, which probably means halfway through <laughs> September. <laughs> but uh, no, it's a, there's a, actually a tour already booked for the UK for Jethro Hotel and uh, starting mid September. So you're going to be starts busy, in aren't you? Carlisle. <laughs> of all places, yeah. you're going to be on the road. But, but I'll, no, but I'll be, as I say, I'll be, I'll be playing in London. I think, uh, the, well, you probably know the date, I don't. Something about the 24th, <laughs> is it, or something of. Uh, of May, I think yes. we have a show at uh, Shepherd's Bush. 24th and 25th Bush. of May, the voice of oh, God well has come into my ear. <laughs> wow, okay, so there we go. Really. <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing You'll you You'll be there, I'll be there. Absolutely, in the front row. <laughs> You'll be there waving your flute, as it were. Thanks for coming into the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate it. I think we you. should stop now. I think maybe we will. <laughs> uh, live music here in the studio shortly from Jeff Healy, but not before we see Ian Anderson wearing his Jethro Tull hat. So this is Living in the Past. <laughs> have been rocking out for 30 years now and they've recently been recording at the home of frontman and flute tootler Ian Anderson to produce their first new album for four years. But before we meet the first flautist of rock, here's a reminder of how the tal used to be. <laughs> Let's go living in the past. 
past Jethro Tull from their 25th anniversary video there, and they're motoring on to their 30th now because they've got a new album out just out today, Roots to Branches, and Ian Anderson joins me now. So Ian, the, um, this new album, I, I, it sounds to me quite different, the quality of your flute playing on this one. I was wondering whether the Divinities project that you were in talking, us, talking to us about a few months ago had anything to do with it. Inevitably, there must have been a lot of um, cross-fertilization, particularly with some of the, some of the tracks, because uh, um, I, probably the, 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 the time we started working on Divinities, I think I actually demoed two or three of the pieces that eventually found their way onto the new Tal album, albeit in a very sketchy way, but th there was that sort of feeling that there was something parallel, even though they were destined for, you know, quite different uh, end functions and to an extent with different people. But yeah, and, and combined with that, my more recent interest in trying to play the flute a bit more properly has sort of made the flute more prominent I hope in a you know, sympathetic way, but it, it's, it's still why, more in evidence Why now. did it take so long for you to, um, I'm sure you're being modest here, but why did it take you so long to, to want to play the flute better? Well, I, I, the curiosity value of the flute, as, as I thought it appeared to other people, was, was such an obvious part of Jethro Tull's image, if you like, you know, the, the planning, well, I'm even doing it now, sitting down, <laughs> you know, the, the one-legged sort of thing. Have you and stopped it, playing on one leg now, then? Well, you, you know, when the photographers are there for the first couple of numbers, you slip it in, just yeah. say, get, get, they get their picky, and then they can right. get on their way, go home, really bad. Um, but the, uh, the, the whole sort of image thing was, it was I was a bit self-conscious about mm. how, how the flute tended to have to be there, because it was a thing people thought of me as doing. Um, and so sometimes I felt I'd put the flute into pieces of music where it really didn't belong. And sometimes I would studiously keep it out of pieces of music rather than overdo it when perhaps it did have a function. So mm. it, and I really felt terribly comfortable about, uh, about its presence to the extent that it was there, combined with the fact that I, I was self-taught and I hadn't learned to play even remotely properly. So I was doing an awful lot of things wrong, which were very limiting to my technique all the way through until... Uh, until fairly recently. What sort of things were you doing wrong? I mean, it always sounded pretty good to me. That breathy tone that you had, I thought was quite distinctive. Yeah, well, that's, that's, still, that's easy enough to do that. I mean, I haven't, that, that, that's still a component part of things, but it was, I didn't really have an option. That was really all I could do. Because <laughs> I didn't really have the, the embouchure wasn't right and, and the way I was holding my head wasn't right. And I, I was born with this deformed little finger, so right. I couldn't really handle the, the keys at the bottom end very well oh, okay. either. So I developed a form of fingering, which was very, you know, uh, incorrect, and yeah. therefore the intonation wasn't good. I was playing harmonics rather than pure notes a lot of the time. And anyway, just to cut a, what could be a, a horribly long story, reasonably short, I took about two really solid months of, of practice a couple of years ago now to, to try to make the conversion to the more authentic, you know, traditional technique of flute playing. And, and it was a it was a touch and go thing. I nearly lost my bottle and went back to my old incorrect ways, but finally pass through the pain well, threshold. Well, I, I, can, I can vouch for that. You can certainly hear the results on this record. This is, this is the most impressively well-formed flute playing I think I've heard in a Jethro Tullerman. But anyway, the actual songs on this album, um, Ian, they seem to, a lot of them refer to, to foreign parts. I don't know if there's a theme running through this album. I haven't, I haven't sort of penetrated it far enough to say, but I mean, there certainly is something going on here that's, which escapes the casual listener. What's this, what's this album about? Um, it's about the sort of music that will continue to escape the casual listener because it is uh, blatantly uncommercial in the sense that it is, tends for the most part to be denser, musically a bit more complex. It's not particularly difficult to play, but it is, it is detailed, it is mm. textured, and melodically, um, within my limitations as a singer, which are considerable, um, but the freedom of working with a, you know, a, a good bunch of guys who enjoy playing and enjoy unashamedly the the rapturous getting into detail and, and, and having fun with it and improvisation you know which is enjoyable it's mm. great fun as long as you don't bore people too long then th these things all conspire to make music which is necessarily a bit more complex and a bit harder to listen to than most of what passes for pop and rock and music. is there is there any attempt here to go back to the to the the concept album days of the mid 70s and albums like thick as a brick it, it's something that continues to be 
suggested to us by a number of well-meaning fools um, that we should do, you know, another concept album, the mother of all concept albums. Um, and I suppose if anybody was going to, to, to do that, it would... Well, Michael, Michael Field already did, didn't he? Yeah. He went back to do sort of a remake of Tubular Bells or a, a second edition or whatever. But I don't think that would really work. And although, I have to say, when I started off working on the ideas for songs for this, there, there were some common grounds, as you have noticed, even on first listening, there was a, you know, a hint of something that lyrically perhaps is, mm -hmm. you know, relating a few songs together, but only in the same way as perhaps it did with the, with the album Aqualung a long time ago. It was never a concept album. It just had a few songs that were, you know, touching on the same topics, it, not unlike this, that were of a yeah. sort of... You know, sort of a religious so the, nature. The so and the sound of the album is quite reminiscent, isn't it, of, of the, the stuff you were doing around that time in the 70s. I mean, some of the way that the, your flute interacts with uh, Martin Barr's guitar playing. I mean, we do seem to be back on, on familiar ground here. Yes, and, uh, and familiar ground is, is, is nice to have, as well as um, it's a sort of point, I suppose, from which you continue to launch yourself on limited sorties into more dangerous territory. But I think you've always got to come back to the thing that you feel confident about is your own sort of sense of roots and in my case although I grew up enjoying and listening and, and in trying to play blues I'd be kidding myself if I thought that that was the uh, the familiar territory to which to return every time mm. because it, it it's not I mean I'm not you know I'm not black I'm not from America I didn't I, I don't have that real experience so all I can do is you play know, the flute on one leg yeah exactly <laughs>